late, but it's okay. The, let me put the yeah. In, uh, who will introduce his projects, but also this lecture is going to introduce the topic of this week of the Escuela de Arte Util, which is week six, yes, and it's going to be about sustainable outcomes. So Rick Law is a Houston-based artist who has exhibited and worked with communities nationally and internationally. His work has appeared in Contemporary Art Museum Houston, Museum of Contemporary Arts Los Angeles, Noberger Museum, New York, Phoenix Art Museum, Kwanju Biennale, the Kumamoto State Museum in Japan, the Venice Architecture Biennale and Documenta 14 in Kassel, Germany, and Athens, Greece. He is best known for his project Row Houses, community-based art project that he started in Houston in 1993. Additional community projects include the Watts House project in Los Angeles, the Borough project in Charleston with Susan Lacey and Mary Jane Jacobs, the Day Ray Beach Cultural Loop in Florida, and the Anyang Public Art Program 2010 in Anyang, Korea. Among Rick's honors are the Rudy Bronner Awards in Urban Excellence, the I uh, sorry, AIA Keystone Award, the Ains Award in the Arts and Humanities, the Skogin Governors Award, the Scandalaris Award for Art and Architecture, and the U.S. Artist Booth Fellowship. He has served as a Loop Fellow at Harvard University, a Melking Fellow at M MIT, an Auburn University Brandon Scholar, and a Stanford University Haas Center Distinguished Visitor. President Barack Obama appointed Rick Law to the National Council on the Arts in 2013, and in 2014 he was named a MacArthur Fellow. So thank you very much, Rick, for being here. The floor is yours. All right, thank you guys for that energizing Welcome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about. Can we turn it down a little? This is a little loud. Okay. Okay. Uh, you could probably turn it down even a little lower. Maybe, yeah, okay. Okay, all right, so, <clears throat> so since the topic is sustainability, um, sustainable, I'm gonna talk about three projects that I've worked on. And um, because it's interesting for me to kind of learn from, I, I, you know, it's, I was trained as a painter, right? And one of the things I always, as a, in painting, I was always taught was that you, you work on multiple things because you teach yourself. You know, when you're working on two or three paintings at a time, one painting's gonna tell you something about what's you know, happening with the next one. And so I kind of do the same thing in the context of this uh, social and community engaged work. And, um, <clears throat> and so right now, I'm kind of being taught by three different projects. Uh, one that was started uh, 24 years ago, this Project Row Houses. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's about long-term sustainability. You know? and, uh, and then <clears throat> another one started around 20, it officially started in 2013, and it's still going. And then there's the one that, um, that I just started kind of this past year, and so it's kind of just kicking up. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna present them in, in, in the order of the most recent, the shorter term, and then the midterm, and then the longer term. So I'll talk about Project Row Houses last. <clears throat> the, um, the, the thing about the, 
the beginning stages of a project for me, uh, and, and this is where I am with the project in Athens, which was uh, started out a part of Documenta, but it's continuing along afterwards. It's, um, it's, it's like that it's, it's so invigorating to see something start to take shape, something that you know you basically have no you know, you don't really know what it, what the possibilities are and what it might become. So you just, every, every second, you know, every moment, you're trying to figure things out. So it just, it's so full of life. And, um, and then you keep going until you get into the second stage where it gets a few years and, you know, and, and it's, not, it's not a new thing any longer, so people aren't all excited to, you know, come and help and stuff, but, you, but there are things there that you start to say, you know, you start questioning when, the, when is it appropriate to be the end, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's, that, that's the stage of the project that's in Dallas that I'm going to talk about. And then you got Project Rojas, where I've, you know, I've been in and out of that project at least, I mean, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. I've been in and out of that project probably about four or five times. But because of the deep rootedness of my engagement, each time I kind of almost reside to say that I'm kind of done with it and I need to move on, something else will kind of pop up and will we'll, uh, kind of give it that renewed energy of almost like it was in the beginning. So there's always new beginnings within, within the project. So <clears throat> I'm going to just start here with, um, so these are the three projects, but, uh, and, and also it's interesting too about these three projects is that, you know, they were all, they all came about in different ways. So Project Row Houses was a project that, you know, myself and, a, and uh, with the support of a group of artists, um, initiated this project. So there was no institutional uh, uh, framework that we had to respond to. I mean, it was purely uh, a community-based project. The project in Dallas was started through uh, an exhibition at the, um, put on by the National Sculpture Center. And so it had certain kind of, you know, exhibition parameters around it. And, uh, and certainly uh, Documenta has that as well. So, <clears throat> so the, the big challenge for me in doing this kind of work is that, you know, for me, I, I have to, I have to find some deep level connection for myself to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to commit myself because I always feel like I'm a fraud. You know, I always feel like, you know, I'm stepping in on people's lives and you know they have their needs and they have and they're trying to deal with it the best they can and then here i am coming in like you know the person that's going to bring new life or insight or whatever to them and i and i you know so i'm always a little bit skeptical of 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 why that is to be you know and and you know, just from my standpoint, why should I be doing that? And also from their standpoint, you know, why do they want, why, why would they even want me there? So I, you know, so, so for me, I have to, I have to try to find some really deep levels of connection that will give me a sense that it's okay. And I'm const I constantly feel like the first, maybe the first six months of a project, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for green lights and red lights. You know, the red lights are the ones telling me to just go home. You know, leave this place alone. And the green lights are saying, you know, you know, there's some possibilities, possibilities. And so, so I'm always looking for that. So when I, when I first was invited to go to, uh, to, to work on a project in Athens, <clears throat> um, I started based on it's a very simplistic idea of what the context of Athens was. Um, my first trip to Athens, which was not related to Documenta, was only in 2015. So I didn't, you know, it was, uh, so I don't, I don't have very much experience with Athens at all, <clears throat> Greece, and, uh, Greece or Athens in particular. 
And, uh, but of course, in 2015, I was there for something with a foundation that was uh, asking me to come in to speak about community-engaged art. And uh, it was June of 2015, and I didn't know the politics and everything that was going on there, but a year or so later, I realized that June of 2016 was this, I knew that it was the time in which they were having the referendum as to whether Greece would stay in the EU, but I did not know about this huge influx of refugees that had basically you know, taken over parts of the city. I wasn't, really, I wasn't really aware of that. So when I went back, <clears throat> but I did know that there was, there was a refugee issue and uh, immigrant issue. So when I went back in, uh, uh, through Documenta in 2016, uh, spring of 2016, you know, I basically told the curatorial folks that I wanted to meet, I wanted to learn about the refugee immigrant situation. And so that was the beginning of my project. The first two site visits I made was going and sitting with groups and organizations or leaders that were dealing with the issues of refugees or immigrants. And, um, and it didn't take very long for me to figure this out as I was meeting with people that I couldn't, that I needed like some Greek people. I needed Greek, somebody from, Athens who could be my voice within these community meetings because it didn't make sense with me trying to do it. And um, so these are just a, a couple of examples of um, the kinds of meetings that I was engaging in. <clears throat> the, uh, the one at the top though became really interesting for me because this was um, a group of women that had formed something they call the Melissa Network. It was uh, started based on a Greek anthropologist, a woman who was getting her PhD in anthropology. And uh, she connected with these five women that were uh, former refugees as a, as a way of just kind of understanding what their issues were and, and supporting them. And then, so once they kind of built, built this kind of common bond, then they decided to actually make a, even a bigger uh, effort, and they started this thing called the Melissa Network. And, uh, <clears throat> and this was important for me because when I went to visit uh, this place, Melissa, which was, first of all, it was kind of a little strange, you know, when people say, well, we really want you to meet with this group, Melissa. And I'm like, Melissa? You know, it had such a strange sounding name, and it didn't feel like it was, had any real substance to it. But then when I went there, and I, I understood that, okay, so in, in Greek, apparently, Melissa means B, and Melissa operates within the context of a neighborhood called Kepsales, which actually means hive. So they named their organization to be the bees within the hive. Um, and, uh, but anyway, it, it started to make sense because they were doing this incredibly powerful work with uh, refugees um, that kind of, and, and what was interesting about it too was that the space that they created reminded me a lot of the, the safe space that Project Row Houses try to create for the transitional housing program for single mothers that we do, and uh, which also created a little bit of tension and problem. I mean, I was so respectful of the safe space that they had for women, but here I was a man having to intrude on their space to figure out how to work within that context. So, that, so there are always these kind of things that are, you know, that was kind of a red light for me, but I managed to get through that. But this, this image just kind of, <clears throat> as I was there kind of searching and looking and trying to understand who was there and what, what kind of value I could bring, I met with so many different groups. And the first thing that struck out, stuck out to me about these meeting with these groups that work with refugees and immigrants was that just the mere fact of walking into their offices or their workshop spaces, there was none on the ground floor. I mean, they were all, you know, second floor, third floor, whatever, and up. And, um, and to me, that was kind of, some, I would question that symbolically, you know, if that was a way of kind of pushing this kind of, you know, influx of cultural diversity out of public eye. Uh, I found out later that that wasn't really true, but but those, you know, that was just kind of my method of trying to figure things out. 
But I did, when I met with the Melissa group, that's when I found out that this, the, there's a square just, just off the, around the corner from the uh, Melissa network. It's called Victoria Square. And apparently in 20, June of 2015, that square became a refugee camp. Um, and this is, these are just some images I pulled from online of um, folks that just kind of, you know, just flooded into the square. And it made it such a tough place for the, the business to operate that all of a sudden this kind of weird tension happened there. I mean, from what I'm told, is that, the, um, that on one hand, while you had people were going out trying to help uh, the refugees, taking them clothing and food and stuff, you had the conservative rise of the conservative party that was coming and they were beating people up. So you had this kind of weird kind of conflict there. And a lot of people associated the businesses with, uh, with bringing in the, um, uh, the uh, conservative wing, basically because the businesses were upset because they couldn't operate. I mean, there, there was, in fact, they did a collective action in which they all um, uh, decided to close their businesses and threaten the mayor that they were all going to walk away from their leases because they could not operate if, the, if they didn't do anything about the square. And so, that, so to me, <clears throat> the square became something to me that's symbolic of the whole refugee situation there, and it just became a, kind of a, a no-brainer that it would be a good place to start to, you know, to highlight this issue and to talk about it. But, um, but so I had to start to kind of move in a direction that I felt I had support around this. So my process of doing these things, though, was that the first was meeting with lots of uh, refugee organizations and uh, leaders individually, and then later pulling them together as a group to you know, to speak to them about my observations and what I thought might be possible to get kind of feedback from them. And so I did that on the first go round and got really good feedback. People thought that it kind of, it, it resonated with them that Victoria Square was this place that could, could be um, uh, symbolic for, you know, the issues that were going on. So as we, <clears throat> as I started to get people, you know, we organized these kind of, um, tours of the neighborhood. And so <clears throat> for me as the artist trying to figure out how to, how to, how to get Victoria Square to speak, you know, I had to find a way to, to do it that wasn't, um, that had a kind of a, a, a quality that, that didn't, that wasn't just in the messiness of the square. So as we walked around the square, I ended up seeing this building on the right-hand side there, and thinking about this idea of what, of my experience of, of visiting refugee events and, uh, or, um, or organizations, and that none of them are on the ground floor. They're not very visible in a public sense. And so I knew that, that, that I needed a space that had a real strong public presence. So this building spoke strongly to that because it had these big windows. And, and um, the other thing that was interesting about the building, though, was that it was not on the square. It's about a, it's just a, a block down from the square, but a very strong pedestrian street. And so I thought <clears throat> this idea of taking a space that could focus on the square, could, could get people to see the square, because when you're in the square, you can't really see it. You know, there's so much activity and so much stuff going on that I felt like I, everything would get lost. So taking the idea of the square outside of it into kind of an isolated place became the idea. And uh, so I managed to get this building, which had been closed and uh, not in operation. So we, you know, cleaned up the windows, got rid of the graffiti and all that stuff, and then started to kind of put the word out to artists. I started to put the word out to artists because I knew that also that while these community groups or organizations were interested, most institutions are doing what they do because it's what they've been doing for a long time. And they're not, they're not really capable of kind of shifting gears and moving in a different direction just because somebody comes up with an idea. So what I needed was, a, I needed a, a new group of people that could help kind of 
nurture this idea into the community and, uh, and so that these organizations could find their, their voice in it. And so I started meeting with individual artists from uh, Athens to uh, ask them if they could help me understand the, the cultural context, which actually turned out to be a really great thing because there were, I also learned there was real tension between the cultural community in Athens and Documenta because apparently they didn't feel that Documenta was honoring the, uh, uh, the existing cultural community there. So, so, it, so I had that going for me that the mere fact that I called out to speak to people, they were very excited to talk to me about it because no one from Documenta had been doing that before. So once I was able to do that <clears throat> and I told them about the space, immediately we start getting response. And uh, so things like this, like the, um, uh, this artist had a, who lives a few blocks away, she had a silk screen studio. She had kind of closed down her studio and was spending most of her time in Berlin. And she heard about what we we're doing. She says, look, I have the silk screen studio. I could bring it and set it up for you guys. And the next thing she said, you know, oh, I could do some workshops with uh, uh, folks if you want to. And so we pulled in the women from Melissa, uh, the refugee uh, 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 organization. And they started to work, do workshops on helping us design the facade of the building and what kinds of things we wanted to happen there. And, uh, and as we were doing that, then we also started to find people from, um, uh, people from around the neighborhood. I mean, because, you know, vertical lifestyle there with people looking out at the balconies, kind of seeing what we're doing, people walking down the street. And then people started bringing things to us. So, so we were able to start doing these workshops with... Um, uh, starting with the silk screen stuff, doing the, uh, the facade of the building, but also you know, providing other kinds of workshops you know, as we went along. And then I started to, to start to coalesce this team of people that, was, um, you know, that became really good stewards of this idea around uh, dealing with this issue of the infusion of refugees and immigrants within what, was, what they considered one of the old bourgeois neighborhoods of, of Athens. In fact, it was um, uh, up until the 19, late 1980s, it was one of the kind of the end neighborhoods. And then, you know, as people start moving to the suburbs, uh, immigrants start moving in. And then, of course, then the refugees start to fall in after that. So, <clears throat> so finding this kind of Framing this, this, this neighborhood through a cultural lens became the, uh, uh, the vehicle through which we could start to get people to have conversations that they wouldn't normally do. And, um, and you know, I'm just going to go through a few more images here of just different kinds of meeting activities and things, the kinds of um, uh, engagements fairly broad, Most, mostly we started within the confines of this space, but then we started to move outward into the street. Uh, this is uh, El Pito Street. And the other thing too about you know, this kind of project was, uh, and I look for these things when I'm working on this, like little symbolic meaning in things that, that you can kind of you know, help give people something to hold on to. And one of the very simple things that came up that people got really excited about was the fact that that I selected that location, that little building, that no, everybody had ignored, nobody thought very much about it, but all of a sudden it became kind of a beacon uh, for the, the neighborhood. But also the street, El Pitos. I had no idea what El Pitos meant, but El Pitos mean hope in, uh, in Greek. And so, so all of a sudden, you know, people start calling it the Hope Project. And, uh, and so we started to do, you know, to, to be able to use the street to get people out, this is a, uh, a project with, uh, that started out to be one with uh, refugee youth, but then the parents of the youth participated in this boat making uh, workshop just kind of went all the way down the street. And then there, you know, there are the traditional things. The other thing that, I, that I've figured in this process too that it was really critical was that my naive, approach to this was to think about what can we do to deal with the refugees and immigrants? What kind of programming can we do? How can we connect this, whatever? But <clears throat> as I started to understand that tension between the, the refugees, the immigrants, and the, uh, 
in the Greek store owners, I realized something that actually a key component of this neighborhood uh, 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 development going forward lie in the hands of the, uh, the native Greeks. And so we had to figure out a way to actually bring them into the, into the project and give them a way to feel like that, that they're not excluded from it, that they're actually a part of it so that they understand that, that, um, that, that going forward, the neighborhood is not going to be like it used to be. It's going to be a different place, but there's a relationship that you can have within this different place that is not um, that could be rich. And so, so this is a this is an example of one of the workshops with uh, Greek storytelling. This one is a, a Ukrainian fashion show. It's called Visavanka Day. Uh, this is a Africa Fest nighttime uh, activities. Uh, on the top, and then on the bottom is a um, uh, Georgian song uh, evening. But anyway, so pulling all these different people in from different places to, to try to get them connected. And as the team was uh, kind of pulling together, this is the woman on the left-hand side became really, really critical in the project. It's, her name is uh, Maria Papadimitrio. Maria represented uh, Greece in the 2015 Venice Biennale. And, um, and she heard about the project and she was very, very skeptical in the beginning. In fact, the first meeting we had, she, um, you know, she basically uh, kind of put the word out that, you know, why is this guy from Texas coming here, you know, trying to do this project? There are so many artists in, in Greece that are, doing work like this, you know, and, and, you know, and, um, you know, and when she, when she hit me with that, and I just told her, I said, you're right. You know, I said, but the situation is this, that, you know, this is an opportunity that Documenta has provided, and they provided it through me. Now, it's, my, it's up to, to me and you and others to figure out how we can use it and leverage it for the context of this, uh, of doing something in this neighborhood. And after um, a couple of weeks, she wrote me back and she said, look, I'm gonna be full in on this project, 100%, but I want no recognition from Documenta. And so, you know, so several of these artists, um, in the lower right-hand side, uh, Nico Nicolopoulos is also a uh, great artist there. And then uh, Ellie Christaka, uh, the young woman there is uh, the project manager. And so we set out to start, so then, once I had these guys kind of full in on the project, then it was like I was start to, to, to figure out some things uh, pretty quickly, like strategies that we could get people to talk to each other when they wouldn't before. The businesses who had this weir really weird tension with the uh, refugees and immigrants, they weren't talking to each other. So nobody understood what the tensions, what was at the root of the tensions. And so, so we, we figured we needed to get them to start speaking. And so... We came up with this um, uh, idea of a newsletter, newspaper, that we call One to One. And the idea behind the One to One was to have, to go out and find you know, two businesses that would be willing to be on this newspaper and that would talk about themselves, this neighborhood, and how it got to be where it is. And, uh, and we published this thing every week. And when we started out trying to get people, it was very slow. But we talked to a guy who has a fish restaurant across the street from us, and he, he liked the idea so much. He said, look, we need this so badly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take this on. And so he took it on and started calling people himself. And we went from the 12 or so businesses that we had to now, I think we're at 84 that are participating in the uh, in the one-to-one. -one. So it's really, and that's something that, you know, he's taken on as, as something that he owns as a way of organizing the businesses and trying to get them to at least listen and be a part of this process and, um, uh, and see how we could move that forward. And so, <clears throat> so now, the, now the space operates with loads of activities, loads of workshops and, and um, uh, uh, events and 
and such. But then we had to figure out a way that we could keep the kind of creative energy flowing through. So we've also now we've moved from, well, we have this space, which is a two-level space. There's a basement space and the ground floor space. But now we have three apartments going up on, uh, ab above the fish restaurant, which allow us to do residencies. And, um, and, and actually, the fish restaurant uh, owner is the one who made the relations with the, uh, for the apartments and stuff. So, so we're having some really good partners there. But the other thing about the space, though, in this particular location, is that it is a place where people kind of move through. And we've, we've kind of made this kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of safe space for conversation with people within the, um, uh, yeah, within this area that we're not talking before. In fact, you can see, uh, Lucia was telling me that Suzanne was, there, was talking about it, but there's Suzanne sitting there. Uh, she came to visit uh, up here, the, uh, Deborah Fisher and Elizabeth Grady from uh, Blade of Grass. You know, so, you know, one of the, the, the thing is, is trying to figure out this space that we have so that you have a, a multi layer thing where there are people from the neighborhood, there are businesses, there are organizations, there are uh, people that are visiting from the outside. You know, I always tell people that it's so important to realize that, they're, that, that my projects, for instance, they, they, they rely on. Uh, you know, several concentric circles of, of, of activities. There's the core, which is the people that live there. They're the ones that, that the project is really for. And then, as the artist, you try to fit as close into the core as possible. But then, outside of that core is another circle, which the artists are naturally, because sometimes we're not completely in the core, we're not a completely, but we're really close to it. But then, being outside of it, we also connect to another level, you know, our network of people that we can bring in, that can bring resources in, that who also may make it to the core or not. And also some of those people in the core will make it out in terms of the second layers, artists, where they make it out into these other networks. And so trying to, to build this thing out. And, um, and so, so having folks like Suzanne and the folks from Blade of Grass and other people from around the world who, through documentary, were coming to visit this place became a great platform for us to try to expand that network and try to connect people from the core all the way out to the edges. And, um, and so that project, it was documented in Athens, closed on July 16th, but it is, uh, uh, we've managed to get, uh, get enough resources that we can at least keep it going until uh, April of 2018. But it's looking like the municipality is, uh, is gonna try to keep it going even longer. And one of the, the, the other thing, though, is that, you know, Greece is a very contentious political place. And there are many, 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 many parties. And in fact, you know, it's uh, in, in our district, District uh, 6, there are 13 councillors within our district, with um, ranging from the, the party, the Golden Dawn, which is the fascist party. That's a party that was beating people up. It's very anti-immigrant uh, 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 and uh, uh, refugee to the Communist Party. And so you've got like these, and you've got fractions. You have like several left-leaning and several, you know, fascist-leaning and several in the middle. So it's kind of a, it's a strange, strange kind of dynamic. But the Interesting thing, though, Maria has been really good at this, and having that's why having someone who knows the local uh, uh, politics and the way things get done is very, very, very helpful. Because you know they were doing things that would make me very nervous, All right? So I go to the fish restaurant, which is our kind of our partner, and um, and I walk in, and Maria says, you know, so the person I'm speaking to, you know, she's from the far right party, and you know, and she's been coming over watching what we're doing and she really likes it and she really wants to, to be engaged. She wants her party to be engaged with what we're doing because the election's coming up. And I'm like, that makes me very nervous. <laughs> and then she goes, no, 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 but don't worry about it though. She says, because tomorrow, the person's coming from the far left party and then I'm gonna to talk to them, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, so walking this kind of tightrope of all these different parties is very 
kind of tricky thing that there's no way I could, do, I could understand from the outside, but having someone inside becomes you know, critical. Now, I'm going to move from, so this is a project that's been going now for about, uh, started research stuff last year in the summer, but actually on the ground working since maybe January. And um, now I'm going to go into uh, translation Vickery Meadow, which is in Dallas. <clears throat> this, this project, I was introduced specifically to this neighborhood. So the, 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 the project in Athens kind of grew out of my own research and my own interests or whatever. But in, in, uh, in Dallas, they specifically introduced me to this neighborhood because in their minds, they thought that I might have something to offer um, because of the context that, it, that was, was developing there. And the context is that <clears throat> if you see all this blue property here, all of this is, uh, it's just 1970s style suburban apartment complexes, like the ones on the right hand side. And um, in fact, in this area, it's probably one of the most dense places in Dallas. I think at, at the highest point, they say that there were some 50,000 people living uh, in this area. Um, and um, but when, and when it was built, it was built as like the really hip place for young gr college grads to move to. And uh, that typical kind of southern suburban style design where you don't have sidewalks. You know, everybody drive their cars into the parking garages and go into their houses. Stuff. And they, when they need things, they go out of the neighborhood to the shopping malls and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not, a, there, there's nothing about public space in these kind of things. And, um, but apparently in the, in the late 80s, and, um, there was some changes in the Fair Housing Act that kind of broke up these single use or design housing for, um, uh, for singles. So they started making uh, one bedroom apartments you know, combining two of them and making two to three bedroom apartments and making it so that families could be there. And so when they did that, along with normal depreciation, lower income families start moving in, lower income whites, lower income uh, Latinos and blacks. And so the neighborhood started to kind of shift. And by 2012, when I first went there, you know, I, I took these images because they were, you know, I mean, there were many more of these kind of images where there was such a heavy police presence in this area. And um, in fact, I, I don't know about you, have you guys ever been in a neighborhood with those kind of towers, like the police towers? I mean, I, was, I found it really offensive, sh shocking. I mean, it was just really weird. But, um, but so, <clears throat> but, but it, it symbolically tells you what people think about the neighborhood. And, uh, and what I was told, though, was that, that it had become the worst place, uh, had the most crime in the entire city, but also it also had become the most diverse place uh, in the entire city. And the reason for it was that uh, the International Refugee Committee and Catholic Charities had taken because of the vast number of apartments, there were always going to be vacancies. And so they start placing refugees and immigrants there. And so walking down the street, you know, you see people from all over the place, um, uh, you know, looking very out of place too, right? Because it's not really designed, this neighborhood, like I said, was not really designed for people uh, who, you know, who are accustomed to kind of public space. It was designed a very uh, suburban type um, lifestyle. But most of these folks, they needed public space. They needed the neighborhood to work for them because they didn't have the resources to drive to the, to the mall or, and they didn't have the resources to do it. So they needed to figure out how to interact within their community. And, but most people, uh, statistically, they saw that the interaction was all through uh, violence. One of the things that happened that kind of gave me an idea of what might be possible there was that um, I heard about a, a, a group that was called, that did something to call the Mom's Lunch on Wednesdays. And, um, 
and once again, I've had that awkward feeling of being a man trying to go to a safe space for women, which was didn't didn't make me feel good about it. But I, I was very curious, and and um, because there was a group of women that had challenged the notion that that there was that that the place was just so dangerous, and that these that the refugees and the immigrants were bringing so much violence. They said they they thought instead of more policing, that maybe you need to figure out how to get people to connect, you know, get to know each other better. And, uh, and so they started this very simple process of having lunches on Wednesdays, and they would invite, you know, five or six women from four or five different countries. And they would have lunch, and, they, and each week would feature one group, and they would talk about their culture and things that they do and so on and so forth. And, uh, and they did let me go, and I, I remember just sitting in the back listening, and it was the most amazing experience to sit and listen to, I mean, just even as a, as, almost as a performance, it was amazing because the way that it worked was that someone would speak about something, and then it had to be translated into English, and then it had to be translated back out into all these different languages. And then it goes back. So it was like this really beautiful symphony of sounds that were kind of moving through the space. And, and um, it, was, it was one of those really moving moments. And so I, you know, I started to question this idea that maybe, I mean, if you could take that on a more public scale without you know, exploiting people trying to figure out how to work with them to develop a, a structure through which they could, that they could, get, that they could share that same kind of thing um, in an environment that reaches a, a broader audience and broader group of people. So once again, I, I, you know, I connected with a group of artists in Dallas and put together a team of people that we actually went to the streets and start talking to people on the streets in meetings and so on and so forth. And we start talking to them about this idea of maybe developing some kind of market where people could come together and they could share ideas, they could share work, they could share, you know, uh, you know, their cultural perspectives and stuff. And, um, and so it was interesting because, you know, as artists, when you talk to people about art and culture and this kind of stuff, oftentimes people don't know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, they just, they're like, so we were, we were trying to get people to say, you know, look, would you be interested in a market? If we had a market, you could make things and, you know, this kind of stuff. And do you make things? And they were like, no. But one day, uh, a colleague was at this meeting, and she started talking to, um, she asked this woman about a handbag that was sitting on a table. And she said, where'd you get that handbag? And the lady said, I made it. And she was like, but well, I was just asking about, you know, if you made things. And she said, well, you know, I just made this because I needed a handbag. I wanted a handbag, and I liked it. And so, so, th so then we figured it out. We figured, instead of trying to talk to people about it, we needed to create a situation through which they could see what we're talking about. So we went out and we got a couple of apartments in, the, in one of the apartment complexes and we opened up these workshop spaces. And we just, we had artists that were teaching the workshops in the beginning, but very quickly we found that people, you know, people, not, people we're one of the few countries where people don't know how to do things. You know, people from other places, they, it's very natural. They know how to, they make stuff, they, they sing, they share, they do all kinds of things. And, uh, and so it didn't take very long to realize that, that there were loads of talented people within this community and they could do their own workshops. They could start to share among each other. So we had these workshops and then we started talking about a public market. And when we talked about that, and this was a kind of a, a interesting situation with the, uh, the museum folks because you know, it, you know, they wanted me to work in this neighborhood but I don't think they thought that I would do a project that would kind of require them going to the neighborhood. And so, 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 the, so the idea of making this market would say, look, this is a, extending that network, right? I mean, trying to get the, create some layers to opportunities for people within a, a given situation. And the museum became a, a vital part of that. You know, they have a great network. Bring that network you know, into this community. And so we start talking about this market and they said, oh, we don't think nobody's gonna go. And then the people in the neighborhood, the service providers, they're like, oh, people are not gonna go. They don't, they don't trust each other and so on and so forth. So we decided we would just do it around food. 
and, uh, and just see what happens. We'd, we'd ask people to bring food and, and, um, and, and see how this thing go. Right outside of the apartment complex where we had the workshop spaces and we had this big shade tree. It was in, uh, in August and we thought, let's just give it a shot. And, and when we, you know, we had people to just start loading in with all kinds of stuff. We, we thought maybe we'd get four or five people to bring stuff, but we ended up like 12 of 13, you know, different, you know, uh, kind of people bringing different foods. And, um, and it became this kind of real, you know, it was this kind of calming situation within that space. In fact, one of the, the, the best testaments for this project was that as we were setting up and trying to get ready for it, this, this group of uh, uh, young African Americans were walking past and they were like, you know, what the fuck y'all doing, you know? What are y'all doing in our neighborhood? And, and uh, we were like, you know, oh yeah, you wanna come, we're gonna have this little market thing, you know, you wanna come in and, uh, and, and help out? And they were like, yeah, y'all gonna have some kush, you know? And we're like, no, that's not what we're doing. We're not, we're, not, we're not doing that, you know? And he was like, ah, yeah, 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 you know? And he was like all like, one in particular, you know, he was kind of the ringleader and he was kind of like really aggressive. And, um, and so they walked off. And then after we did this event, and we were cleaning up, and it was like maybe about 9 or 9.30 at night. We're all in the apartment kind of, you know, reflecting on what happened. Somebody knocked at the door, and it was this young kid. And what was really interesting about it was that in the street during the day, he didn't have on a shirt, and he was all gangstered out, and he just seemed like this really tough guy. But then when he came back, he had on a shirt, and he was very calm. You know, he was very quiet. And he says, he says, you know, I was sick today and I didn't come. I didn't come to the, to the thing, but I was watching out of my window. And he was like, you know, we, we never see anything like this in our neighborhood. It's like, what are y'all doing? You know, you know what, is, what does this mean? You know, what are, what are y'all trying to do? And, um, and then from that, that day on, he became one of our biggest um, kind of supporters in terms of getting people out for the, um, for the, um, uh, for the markets. In fact, it was him that helped us come up with this idea of a talent show, which was, uh, which was something that a number of us didn't believe in, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, but trying to be responsive to and, and engaging with people about, you know, this is their community, these are their ideas, they, this is what they want, and let's see. And so we did the poster, and the poster was kind of goofy, but people just said, you know, you gotta put everybody's language in it and that kind of stuff. So, you know, just, I mean, so we were just following what people were uh, saying to us. And then we did this, um, this um, the, the talent show, we added the, the talent show level to it. And it just became, this, this thing just kept growing and growing and growing. And um, for that talent show, um, uh, the, the, the initial talent show, we had 27 performers. We were only supposed to go for a couple of hours, but it ended up going four hours because they had more and more people that wanted to perform. From, for, all the way from a, like a, an 18-month-old little uh, girl from Somalia uh, doing a dance all the way up to like an 86-year-old white guy from the neighborhood doing the hokey pokey. And so everything in between, you know? So it was this kind of you know, kind of dynamic of getting people to, you know, to connect and see themselves in a different way with different possibilities. Now, so, so we started doing these markets <clears throat> uh, every month and they were going along and then, um, but we started to notice that there were people that were doing things that were more interesting than just um, like the crafts and stuff that we were putting out on tables for, uh, to sell at a market. We thought we needed some way of showing work that honored the work that people were making. And so <clears throat> we thought about getting more apartments and kind of whitewashing the walls and putting up um, uh, uh, work there. But then I was talking to a friend of mine, Mark Bradford, <clears throat> who's down in LA. And Mark was, we were talking, and he was talking about his show at White Cube in London. And, uh, and he was talking about the fact that one of his paintings was gonna go for over a million dollars and all that stuff, and I was like, you know, it was, it was kind of the, the art market. I know very little about it. So I was, I was so blown away. But I was teasing him and I said, you know what? We got all these people in Vickery Meadow, man. We need a white cube in Vickery Meadow. If, if, that, if you can use a white cube to escalate the value of work that way. 
And, you know, and just this idea of, of making things seem important, you know, the, the idea of like putting things on a pedestal or putting things in a white cube, whatever. And so I went back and I, and I talked to a group of architects that I knew in Dallas and I, and I challenged them. I said, you know, could you design something that is really cheap, of, you know, to build that's like a little white cube, just enough space so we can do little exhibitions in them. And, um, and they came back with some really interesting uh, uh, results that we end up getting these little boxes that we could do different things to them on the outside. And we placed them along the, um, uh, uh, along the, one of the, the, the main streets that go through. And, um, and they became like these kind of public amenities for the neighborhood. I mean, you know, places for people to stop and see artwork, but also some of the times they were just, you know, bus stops for people because, you know, the bus stops didn't have covered areas, so people would actually just use them while they're waiting on the bus. But, um, but this became a, a, a way that we could actually, you know, present work by people within an, in the neighborhood in a way that kind of showed it with a different light. Now, so this, this project went, you know, I was kind of fully engaged in this project for about two years. And, um, and I was very fortunate that Suzanne Lacey had a student, uh, Carol Zhu, who, had, who was from Austin. And she had started coming to visit the project early on and, and engaging in it. And so after the, uh, going into the third year, I challenged her, you know, I said, look, I'll find some resources if you really wanna, if you really wanna work on this thing and you can make it yours. You can, you can start to put your imprint on it because it needs that kind of full-time engagement that I couldn't do. And so she's taken it on and has uh, continued to produce amazing things with a growing uh, community and, and in a little bit of a different way because some of the challenges are very different now than they were then. Uh, the challenge of that neighborhood back when we first went there was that it had such a negative, um, uh, there was such a, uh, negative perceptions of it. But during the course of two years of this kind of program that we were doing, all of a sudden it started to turn the corner again. And, uh, and people started to talk about Vickery Meadow in a way that wasn't just about you know, crime. And so that started to put pressure on the neighborhood folks. Um, and so Carol has been really, really great in terms of pulling things in a, in a more activist way, uh, focus on the neighborhood folks. And so while when I was developing the project in the context of this exhibition, trying to make a, like more of a public statement, a public art statement, without the framework of the exhibition, it's allowing Carol to actually focus strictly on what the, uh, uh, what the needs are of the folks within this community. And, She's been doing some great things. I mean, there's you know all kind of workshops that they do, and uh, uh, there's food certifications and all kinds of stuff there. So <clears throat> this project is still going. I meet with Carol at least once a month. You know, and we continue to talk about you know how the project's going and uh, what kinds of challenges and uh, opportunities are there. And uh, now I'll move on to the final one, Project Row Houses, which is. Um, which has been a long journey. And, um, and this, is my, this was my first entree into doing uh, social and community engaged work. I, I actually started to do this, I was trained as a painter and um, installation artist. And I started to do this work because I had a, a, a teenager to challenge me about the value of the work that I was doing. Even though it, it dealt with political and social issues, this student challenged me and he said that, you know, people in communities know what the issues are. They see it, they live it every day. They don't, you know, that's, that's, that's not meaningful for them. He said, if you're an artist and you're creative, why can't you create a solution? You know, because that's the thing that, that, that communities are, are looking for. They're not looking for people to tell them, you know, what issues are. And so, that was the, the beginning point for me to start thinking about how, how to engage in work that is poetic and symbolic, but at the same time has a practical application. 
And so that's been the, that's the journey that has kind of led me to doing the kind of work that I've, uh, I've talked about before. And it all came through this <clears throat> situation here in the uh, neighborhood in Houston. It's called the Third Ward, which was a neighborhood that had been uh, uh, that disinvested in for, I mean, since the late 60s, going into the early 70s. And, um, and so housing stock falling down, uh, loads of buildings, you know, being taken out. And, um, and so I kind of gravitated toward this, uh, the idea of the shotgun house through this, this artist named John Biggers, who talked about the history of the shotgun house and its connection to black people through the slave trade into uh, uh, the, the, the plantation south and all of that stuff. And I thought that would be a good symbolic place to start, but we can do it in a way that has some real practical um, uh, outcomes. And so, <clears throat> so starting this project, you know, we started focusing on the shotgun house as a, um, uh, as a symbolic kind of iconic uh, uh, structure and changing people's perception of it because most people uh, in the black community, you know, thought very negatively about the shotgun house and um, and so trying to figure out how to position it in a way that they could see it in a different light. So we started with just cleaning it up and talking about the architecture and the value of it, but then we wanted to figure out how can we. Well, let me also just go back and and and. and and just say this, though, that something I learned from John Biggers, which was really uh, uh, important for me, talking about what, the, um, uh, what goes into a good neighborhood. A good, yeah, a good neighborhood. And um, he talked about the importance of the architecture. You know, he's like, the architecture is what, you know, it's a physical place. It's, it, 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 it allows us to move through it and how we treat the architecture will have a huge impact on, on how we live our lives psychologically, spiritually, and physically. And, um, but then secondly, he said though, that art and creativity and culture is the thing that brings life to the architecture and brings life to community. And, um, and once you have those, and the third thing he said, then you have to start thinking about how do you educate people so that they understand the value of the architecture, and the art and culture. And then the fourth thing was a social safety net. He talked about how do you, you know, if you, if you have the architecture, you have the art and culture and education, but still, how do you take care of those people that are really, you know, falling through the cracks? And, um, you know, I, I, one of the most impactful stories I remember him telling me was that how, he said, you know, people say these shotgun houses are small and they're not fit to live in, but he said, you know, if you think back 60 or 70 years ago when lots of black people lived in, in shotgun houses, you didn't have nearly the kind of homelessness that you have now, right? So in these little houses, you could have up to, you know, eight, 10, 12 people living there, but they all had a place to stay and they always they had food, you know, and they had a community of people that cared for them. And um, so, so those were the, you know, the, the things, those were the four things that I always start trying to think about when I go into community work and, and, uh, and, and trying to figure out, you know, you know, where the value is in those places, looking at those principles. And so we started to, to honor the architecture. We just cleaned it up and started to create a language around it. But then we, the art and creativity, we started to uh, connect with artists who could help us kind of, uh, speak and bring life to some of the issues that were going on uh, in, the, in the community. In fact, um, Lucia, this is, this is um, the one in the blue, the one at the top, that's uh, Andrea Bowers, who uh, did this piece, uh, what, uh, that's a quote from Obama uh, in 2006. She did, it was a great project where she did, you know, so the quote from Obama was on the, from 2006 was on the front of the house, and then inside the house, the screen on the, I mean, the image on the right-hand side was a video that she installed in the house that showed the excitement of people at the inauguration in 2008. And then 
you can't see it, but if you were standing in this building, you look back, there was a small television with a, um, with, um, uh, some footage from a 2012 town hall meeting where there's an African American woman asking Obama if, you know, if, if like, you know, if, if his being elected meant that she was going to be losing so much of what, you know, people had fought for. You know, so it was this kind of real interesting, you know, way of getting our community to start thinking about the complexity of having uh, Obama as uh, president. <clears throat> but anyway, so, um, you know, projects like this where people are helping us. In fact, we're going to go back to this because the neighborhood has changed so much, but having a passport for the neighborhood, you know, so that, you know, people can kind of feel a certain kind of owner ownership. Uh, education programs that we've, you know, continued to produce with young people. This is from our uh, transitional housing program for single mothers. Now, th the interesting thing about some of these programs through Project Door Houses for me is always to try to figure out how do you layer them with something symbolic? Because, you know, people do housing all the time, you know, and people do uh, education programs and stuff. So how do you, you know, how do you layer it with, you know, uh, symbolism? And, uh, and that's always something that I'm, I'm, you know, fascinated with. And so, you know, challenging the women within the context of the house, challenging them with, you know, different kinds of programs, challenging them to work with artists and all these kinds of things have really produced the real interesting um, kind of framework for this program. In fact, one of the women actually spoke of it very uh, eloquently when she was telling me, she said, she said she, when she first showed up and she was in this context, it was supposed to be this art place and all, and she didn't quite know what it meant and how to feel about it. And after the first year, she said she started to get it. She's like, now I got it. What's happening here is really is that this community is an art project and Project Row Houses is transforming it. I am, my body, I'm an art project, and every day I'm sculpting myself, you know, and, I'm, I'm, and I make choices uh, for myself just like an artist would do when they're painting or sculpting or something like that, which is kind of, um, you know, that really kind of hit, uh, hit, hit the nail on the head for me of trying to, you know, articulate what it is we're trying to do when we're doing things like a Young Mothers program. <clears throat> and then we continued, once we started with these 22 houses and started these multiple programs, we saw an opportunity to actually uh, to expand into housing a little bit further. And, um, and the reason for that was because of the context where the project is. It's in this red area here that's in between downtown on the north, uh, the University of Houston on the east, and on the southwest is the Texas Medical Center. And all those you know, large institutions are kind of aggressively pushing and driving the market. We started to see things like this happen. Um, this is, now these images are from like maybe 2000, 2000, 2001. And, uh, and we got like this first set of uh, townhouses that kind of popped up. And, uh, and, our, and our response to it though was to say, then we need to be a little bit more aggressive around our housing efforts and start looking at different kinds of housing type and start multiplying our housing approach. But in a very small scale, in a way that we could really pay special attention to the architecture, uh, you know, to the, 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 the lots that we choose and all these different kind of things and kind of making these things kind of um, uh, come together in a way that, uh, th that felt special. Now, and so we were kind of pushing out into this larger scale thing, but I, for me, I always, I always have to do this kind of balance between what is the, the large scale of things, but also the intimate qualities that really make a neighborhood. And you know, these are, the, these are just a, a couple of uh, examples, and these are from the early, mid 2000s. Um, you know, I started making these posters to kind of highlight neighborhood folks to sh show them in a way that, that, uh, that emphasized the value of their contribution. The one at the top was this guy who would just, um, you know, 
uh, he would always play a saxophone throughout the neighborhood, but always when there was a fire, somehow he managed to be there. And so I started to document those, and I made these posters of him doing that and, uh, and putting them around. And so people all of a sudden, just a way to get, let people see him in a different light. You know, he's not just a crazy guy that's, that's walking through the neighborhood, but he's, maybe there's some value that he has. And then the one at the bottom was um, the one that was the, one of the most successful ones where this guy on the left-hand side at the bottom, his name is Eugene Howard. He called himself brother-in-law. And um, he had been in prison for over 20-something years, came out and didn't know anybody in the neighborhood. And, uh, and I started helping him out a little bit and starting a conversation with him and asking him if he could start his life over again, what would his dream have been? And he said he would have liked to have had a, ca a cafe. So we went out and I thought I would make a poster of him. And so we went out and we, I got all this stuff and we dressed him up and I did this little poster of him and put it around the neighborhood. And it was amazing how it transformed him because you know people would see it and they would call him out and all that stuff. you know. And, but then we started to contract with him on little things that we were doing at Project Throw Houses. And, this, and he, for about four, the last four years of his life, he died about four years ago. But the last four years of his life, he became like a neighborhood celebrity. He had t-shirts, he had aprons and mugs and all this kind of stuff. And he was, you know, and he was one of those people that was always at any kind of community event and, uh, and, and providing his services. But then, but then that's the intimate way of dealing with it, but then as an institutional way of trying to figure out how do we deal with this structurally in terms of preparing people to, uh, to exist ongoing in our community. So we started to incubate uh, small businesses. Uh, this is a co-op radio uh, station there. We started to build stronger partnerships with, um, uh, uh, with partners that we thought would share our vision. Uh, the one on the upper right-hand side is a, uh, was our first coffee shop to uh, come to the neighborhood. On the left-hand side is the early childhood education center that we partnered with a group to do. And um, uh, downstairs are two spaces that we're working. Well, on the right-hand side is a, one of our incubations. It's a little bakery. And on the left-hand side is a rental space. So, <clears throat> so then you, you know, when we start thinking about the context of a place like this, in a place like Houston where there's vast amount of land, land is cheap, and, um, and, and you're very close to um, these major institutions, there, it's just ripe for gentrification kind of stuff to happen. And we had a very challenging situation to happen in our area, we had a, there was a neighborhood park that was called Emancipation Park. And, um, and in my mind, parks need to be cared for and invested in. But, you need, but, it, but there's a way to do it that's relevant to the place where it is, instead of some kind of futuristic idea of what it could be. And our community went the opposite direction. So they, this, these were the drawings for, uh, or the, the renderings for this new park that has you know, this Olympic style swimming pool, this new building on the left hand side and all this new stuff. And, um, and they were gonna spend $38 million in this park. We had actually, it was, um, I had been in conversation with Walter Hood who's in uh, Oakland about doing this park and we thought like, a six to eight million dollar investment in this park would have been fantastic, uh, but the, some of the community leaders wanted to do something that was more of a legacy kind of thing, but not thinking about the impact that it would have on the real estate market and what that would do, uh, what would be the results of that. So with the buzz of this 38 million dollars going into this park, you know, we start to see you know, more and more townhouses popping up, this little thing that we saw happening a little bit started to like, you know, bombard us. And, um, and then you can see the land values, which is, you know, pretty striking that back when we started in 1994, you know, land was in Houston, in this particular area, it was a dollar per square foot. And, uh, and it just slowly went up, you know, $5, $12, $20 to now 55 and above. And, um, 
which has made it very, very challenging to, to, to think about the future <clears throat> of the neighborhood. However, so I started to connect with folks that I knew from uh, MIT to kind of help bring some brain power behind this, uh, this issue. And so we started to, um, you know, to explore. And it was really interesting, some of the things that they started to, to, to supply us with. So like these are, this is a little map that shows uh, replatting where there are new developments that are happening. So all these little pink spots are new developments that are happening. And they're, you know, and they're going to be townhouses that are priced, I guess, and this one was the low is uh, 379 up to 489. This is in 2014, 14, I think, 2014. This data is coming from there. And then we start to see how the neighborhood is being marketed, you know, as with this very luxury kind of, you know, feel about it. But this is where it becomes, you know, I think is important, you know, for artists to be able to try to stay within the, the, the framework of what's possible. You know, we know all this stuff is happening, and that's, you know, that's what, what, what their agenda is. But what kind of agenda can we build that is one that connects more strongly with the people that exist there already? And so as we continue to do research, we start to find out these interesting things. Like, so all that replatting that was going on looked really threatening, but at the same time we started to look at, you know, so that was only 5.7% of the property, and, but 21.3% is owned by community institutions. And, um, and that's just community institutions. That's not even including all the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the private owners that we've been able to talk to to work with us uh, in this process. And then, um, and then we start looking at these, you know, horrifying, uh, uh, situations here where you know there's almost no new construction permits over a 20 year period almost and uh, but huge amount of demolition permits that have been happening over time but but once again you know exploring more of the the possibilities of where these where the land is that we have connections to and uh, and how we can you know move that forward I'm not going to go through all of these, but then, so we ended up, <clears throat> so, so out of the MIT visits, Project Storehouses ended up starting something that's called the Emancipation Economic Development Council, that's named after the park that's uh, in the area, and, uh, and starting to engage people in our community about the possibilities of, and the responsibilities, who's responsible for how this neighborhood grow, and how we hold them, uh, hold them responsible. And, um, we ended up kind of coming up with this baseline uh, of work groups looking at political engagement. Uh, the Dowling Street Corridor, which is the main street, commercial street that goes through the neighborhood, but it's also, that's also a point of uh, interest that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then anchor institutions. How can we get these institutions around us that want to come into our neighborhood and take it over to actually you know, leverage their buying power to support our community? And, uh, and then, of course, the uh, land trust to deal with the, um, uh, the escalating, you know, prices there. So loads of work, you know, uh, has gone into this notion of holding institutions responsible uh, to the growth of the neighborhood and how it grows and really actually supplying them with what kind of jobs that we could actually um, supply people from the neighborhood in. Now, and I just mentioned earlier about this Dowling Street Quarter. That was, um, that was a very contentious uh, issue in our neighborhood because Dowling Street became Dowling Street in uh, the early 1890s after this group of free slaves that put together the land to establish Emancipation Park. Dowling Street, prior to that, was called uh, West East Broadway. But then the Confederates came along and named the streets bordering the, uh, the park after Confederate soldiers. Uh, Dick Dowling was the name of the person that was uh, the streets named after. So, we, so within this effort, we started pushing for the renaming of the street. 
uh, to emancipation to go along with this, since we're gonna have this new uh, 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 renovation of the park, then it should be reflective of the name. And, what's, and, and you know, it was really interesting trying to deal with the politics of a neighborhood when you're dealing with people on the state level, on the federal level. I mean, politicians have huge egos, and how do you coordinate them in a way that they could move forward together? And so this was a huge effort because we actually end up getting uh, the name changed and, um, and, and, and holding that as one of the victories that can kind of push forward. Because as I said, <clears throat> in closing, I'll say that, you know, my experience in terms of sustainability is that when something is going on for 24 years, or almost 25 years, you know, it's almost impossible that it could have had, you know, you know, that every moment of it is gonna be exciting. So, you know, we're constantly trying to look for those moments in time in which you can, you know, inspire people to, to sustain it to the next point. You know, I always tell people that, you know, to me, sustainability is about, you know, staying alive. You know, I mean, keeping an idea alive because, you know, there's a possibility that, that the reality that you're pushing for may come into being, but it can't come into being if you're not gonna stay alive. You know, if you're just gonna throw your hands up and give up, it's just not gonna happen. So we spent a lot of time trying to reinforce this within our, within our community. Uh, this is a, was a piece by Sam Durant that did this piece on what it has, that we are the people. And that's the, you know, and that's the thing I try to communicate with the people in every community that I work with is that you, know, you have to think of yourself as being important characters and important players within the place that you are. And, um, and, then you, and once you can establish uh, that, you're, that you play an important part, then that gives you a platform through which you can actually really do the work that it takes to sustain it. So with that, thank you. Um, <clears throat> can it, so you, you uh, spoke to it a bit, but the you mentioned at the um, start when you're called into these other projects that you feel like a fraud, um, and I was wondering it, do, what are your strategies for getting over that feeling, um, if there are any besides just engaging yeah I um, I think what the, the, the one thing that I try to do is I try to you know I try to in, I try to find people that are that have deeper roots in the place to you know to kind of give me their approval I mean you're not going to get approval of everybody but just having somebody like even with project row houses for instance I mean there is a um, uh, a person there that I call him a mentor and and I you know and and I, I selected him because of the, the 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 time that he spent in the neighborhood the level of respect that he's had and um, and I know that he's 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 not going to compromise and he will tell me the truth if I'm doing something that's bullshit he'll tell me you know and he will call it out and uh, and therefore but if he does say it's okay and to move forward and do it then it's okay because he will fight the battle, you know. So it's almost like even with the, um, you know, we were we were charting on kind of, um, uh, you know, you know, kind of risky territory when we were in Athens trying to organize among these business people, without us having any real roots there. But now that you know, once we were able to get the guy who owns the fish restaurant to do it, now we can. Now he will fight for us. So it's not me fighting. I mean, I, don't, I mean, because I, you know, if I had to do it, I would really feel like I was, you know, out of line. Um, and in uh, Houston, is your mentors 
measure of bullshit like it only affects you or it is just a gesture that he thinks like w won't work or uh, like what what what's like a 10 on his bullshit meter <laughs> um you know, I, I think one of the one of one of the things, particularly in in um, in, in the Houston context, and I think in others, is that you know you, you build your reputation, you know, and and I think I get to 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 get away w with things and get support of things because of the reputation, you know, and and so and I and also let me just say I had I worked a lot volunteering with this guy before I started Project Row Houses. So it wasn't like I started Project Row Houses and I went and I said, you know, oh, I want you to, like, no, it was, it was, there was a deep relationship that had already uh, developed in a level of respect and he, you know, wanted to support me and, um, and understanding that I had a different uh, skill set, a different framework through which to do the work. He's from a, an old school, kind of, you know, black power activist kind of thing and, and, um, and, and he, you know, he, re he, he respected me enough because of the time that I put in with him that he allowed me to do the other things that he might have been felt a little skeptical about otherwise. Yes. Hi, I wanted to thank you so much for coming. Um, and it's just, it's very interesting how your work has, different disciplines have grown up around your work, like the disciplines around art that relate to community investment and community engagement and the discipline of urban planning, which I now come from. Um, I think the first time I met you, I was at Creative Time, very much coming from that practice. And then the second time I met you, I was in planning school and sort of represent that personally. One of the things that for me I see as a tension, and I wonder if you see it as a tension or not, is two things that you've talked about a lot, which is the role of symbolism and then also the role of technical expertise. Um, I think sometimes people who come from an art practice think that aesthetics and symbolism are sort of owned by this certain world and that, that stuff is not legible to like community members. And what I heard you talk about a lot is just the importance of symbolism to everybody. So I'm interested if you could talk about that and, and also talk about this thing which is sometimes presented as a conflict to that which is um, the role of like community organizers, people who are already m potentially giving services to um, immigrant communities and affordable housing developers. So how do you play with these two ideas of, of sort of the symbolic nature of your work and the practical nature of your work with the institutions and people that maybe specialize in those two things solely and separately? Mm. Well, <clears throat> the, um, the symbolism, you know, I think we, 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 we sell people short all the time uh, uh, from a, uh, a community standpoint. I mean, people are, you know, I, I have this series that I've been working on. I mean, I did I just mention the brother-in-law thing and this other guy with, you know, uh, playing the saxophone. But there's about 10 people in my neighborhood that they're performance artists. I mean, they are, they are so embedded in, in, in presenting themselves in this way that is not the normal. And they know it's not, you know, and they take great pride in how they, how they do it. But we don't have a way of acknowledging that, you know. And, um, and so, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm never worried about, I worry more about the, uh, the art world people being able to handle the symbolism of a community than the people in the community. Because they understand the people that are around them and they appreciate them and they don't, you know, and, and, and they move within, you know, I mean, you know, if you go into, um, I mean, it's, it's, just a, it's, it's amazing to see how the people that, that most people would call misfits how they exist within communities in a very live, vibrant, and real way that, uh, that, that mainstream kind of art world society can only accept that if it's in a performance context. You know, but for those people, it's there every day. 
Now, I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question, though, about the, um, the from the, the community organizer side. Yeah, maybe just more specifically, like, when you're working in some of these neighborhoods who are probably have planners assigned to them and also people from, like, refugee services community, like assigned to those neighborhoods too. How did you play with those people? Like in the in the second to last project you presented about you know making a a pop up. Like now I'm a planner, so I do this stuff too. But I don't call myself an artist, and so and I wonder if how just how you play with those people, or maybe you don't. Like planners and community organizers who are um, doing some similar, like using some similar tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't you know I don't think I think the 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 difference between kind of how how I would or other artists that I know you know kind of work within the context of, of community organizers is that we, we you know we're exploring these things you know we're exploring them we're trying to find what's interesting about it and all that stuff whereas they have a very they're, they're looking toward trying to figure out A to B when you know our thing might go a little bit differently and around a circle and so my experience has been they're not the easiest to work with. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I think, and also, also, I, I also understand that there are amateur planners within neighborhoods all over that are, that to me, have much fresher ideas, you know, if you can weave them in. And, um, and then the planners will come along later. I remember when I started with Project Row Houses, the, 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 the planners in the city of Houston saw what we were doing and they immediately wanted to put up the roadblocks. I mean, they immediately start saying, well, you can't do these, you have to replat and you have to do all this kind of layered stuff that would have killed the project. The only way we got beyond that was that we had, we, we pushed the press. We used the press to leverage against them so that they couldn't move. So basically they end up, we didn't work with the planners in Houston, but they contributed greatly by saying they would just be quiet and leave us alone. Yes. Thank you, first of all, to uh, very inspiring work. Uh, I'm wondering about something. So you, um, you create these projects. Um, you know, it starts small, and it works as a kind of antidote to gentrification almost. Um, so you find plots that are perhaps not desirable, that are cheaper, and then you build that community up. Or you help the community you build it itself up from the ground. And, um, and sometimes you create a kind of ecosystem around it, right? So it's not just the row houses, it's then a bakery. And um, support for other small businesses to really uh, reinvigorate a community. And yet, then you're still dealing with, you know, developers and whatnot, and these kinds of um, uh, profiteers' attempt at gentrification. Anyway, um, do you have any creative thoughts on how to mess with them to make it less desirable for them somehow to then come and capitalize on this, um, you know, bottom-up effort? Well. <clears throat> You know, to me, over, over time, to me, the, the thing that I find about these projects is more important than actual what the outcomes may appear to be is that people are engaged, that they're actively participating in what's happening around them. You know, to me, that's the, that, is the, that is the most valuable thing. I mean, a lot of people, you know, it's kind of like, I used to bump heads all the time with the historic preservationists because you know, I, I use historic preservation in my work when, it's, when it seems like it has value. But to me, the value is not the preservation. The value is what the preservation can do to empower people who are engaged in that process. And so, you know, I, I often have to, you know, I often think about that. You know, it's like, well, you know, okay, so we've preserved these little old houses. And, and there are people that, there are some people that would just fall out if we said we were gonna tear them down and whatever, whatever. But the, but, but the question is like, so what if, the, what, if, what if tearing them down activated so many people to do something else that was gonna, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know if that's a bad thing, you know? And so, 
so, so, so the question of, of gentrification to me is, is about you know, how, how we can produce things to get people engaged in, in, in strategizing and working and fighting for uh, a quality of life that they feel they deserve. And whether it actually exists in that neighborhood or some other place, I don't know. I mean, to me, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that, there's a, that, that the desired quality of life that people are striving for, that they're able to attain that. And so, you know, so, so these kind of projects, it's just a way to awaken people to that possibility that they can, that, that they can work toward that quality of life that they want. Hello? Sorry. Um, thank you so much. Um, my question, it's more of a comment, actually, and it's kind of stemming from the last few uh, folks. Um, you know, I've been in the corporate world for too many years, and um, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were presenting your projects was how similar your skills are to somebody in the corporate world. You're essentially um, <laughs> embracing all the same things that you have to do <laughs> in the corporate world to be successful, and I know it's probably very unpolitical to say this, but um, the difference being your agenda is, from what I'm gathering, to uh, create a conversation within a community rather than um, find a, a return on an investment, so to speak. But I'm, I'm wondering, because your skills are so similar, I mean, you're, you're finding the decision makers, you're um, um, you know, engaging the, the um, influencers and in the, in the community to back you know, your, your projects, you're creating committees, you're finding pathways to, to reach some end, and the end being, in your mind, something that is, I guess, um, morally preferable to what would have happened if you weren't there. Right. How, how do you see, um, I'll put this in corporate terms, your return on investment in this? I mean, how do you see the success or when you've reached some success? Is it that people are uh, communicating with one another, that, that people have understood for themselves what it means to be a part of the community? Yeah. No, I, look, I, I laugh when you say that because I, you know, I think that all the time to myself, too. That I'm, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't seek the, my, my creative output in you know, uh, reimagining structures and those kinds of things. I, I try to engage them as they are and try to make them work you know, in a way that, you know, with imagination. You know, try to make, and, and also in challenging people, not just from a, uh, an intellectual way of how to do things differently, but also an ethical way. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you shape, you know, or how, does a, how can you create a project that, that creates a platform for uh, an, a different kind of ethical platform for a corporate leader? You know, how do you do that? So, for instance, and that's, and I'm fully, I'm fully vested in that in a very uncomfortable way right now because of the level of gentrification that's, happening in, uh, in, our, in our neighborhood. I mean, the way that we're kind of looking at this, I mean, because this is a very undeveloped neighborhood. In the next, whether it's, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I don't know how many years, but there's likely gonna be an, an increase of somewhere around, you know, 20 to 30,000 uh, units of housing, and who knows how much commercial development there. I mean, you know, you know, this is going to be like billions of dollars invested in this neighborhood. So, in order for us to have some kind of impact, you know, we're not talking about, you know, millions of dollars. We're not talking about hundreds of millions. Of, I mean, to really have impact. I mean, I mean, to, to, if I'm really going to be honest about it, I mean, we're going to have to be in the billion dollars of, you know, impact. And how, you know, if, if the neighborhood is going to have that kind of scale impact, so how do you get there? I don't, you know, I don't know that kind of structure. So one of the things that we're doing right now is, is very, very interesting. Um, uh, and I, I look at all these people as being, I, I encourage them to think of themselves as collaborators. I mean, this is, what, this is the task that we have. How do you use your skill sets to help us get there? So now we have this guy who's a great guy. 
He's a, uh, he's a vice president of Heinz Development that develops all over the world. And, um, and he's joined our team. You know, and so the challenge for him is like, okay, if there's, you know, there's going to be 30,000 uh, units of housing developed you know, going forward, what percentage, we have to figure out from a community standpoint, what percentage of that should be affordable? You know, and how do we look at uh, financing models that can actually sustain and support the number of affordable housing that, uh, that we're looking for? And you know, we're starting out exploring this on a small scale within Project Row Houses. I mean, we've, we're, we're, we're adding new properties and that kind of, we buy new properties and that kind of stuff. And we're gonna test it and see. You know, but, um, but yeah, trying to take you know, the, the corporate models, the corporate personalities, the corporate skill sets, and trying to figure out how to get them to apply their intellectual uh, capacity with a different lens from an ethical standpoint. It's, you know, the ethics of not uh, just profit, but you know, building community. So would you call yourself an artist that deals in morality, essentially? What's, what's that? Do you call yourself an artist that, that deals in morality? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, there's definitely an ethical, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, it's a, um, um, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time reading, um, uh, uh, some years ago, reading Aristotle's Ethics. And, you know, and Aristotle says that, I mean, he always talks about justice being the crown of all virtues. You know, and that's what this is all about. This is about justice, you know, and, uh, and we're trying to figure out how to, how to bring it into being within these neighborhood contexts. Um, I have a question related to the longevity of these projects, you mm. know, like, um, and the sustainability. <clears throat> I wonder um, two things. At some point, you might be working in several of these projects at the same time, like your paintings. <laughs> like, uh, so how you deal with all of that and how you deal with not losing the credibility in each of the projects because you cannot be there all the time, something that happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is um, what happens when the community passes into another artist or, or into the com community and how, what is that process looks like and also what happened, for example, with the narrative? Mm -hmm. Are you willing that the narrative completely change or the project shift or are you really interested in keeping some sort of dialogue on that and um, I remember in Chicago when uh, you presented the project with one of the people of the community who mm. were speaking and it was amazing so I'm also interested in what is the training that you give when you decide to either go away from the project for a while or like what is that process? Mm. Well <clears throat> you know Life will, treat, will teach you things, and you know, doing the work will teach you things. And I learned a big lesson from, um, I don't know if um, uh, Alexandra mentioned it in her introduction, the Watts House Project. Uh, and I don't know how many of you are aware of that project, but that was, I learned a lot from that project. And um, uh, you know, it was a project that I spent a lot of time trying to build um, relationships with folks within that community that, I mean, to me, that was such a huge part of the project of Watts was that there were so many different conflicting interests. And so having the Watts House project was worked early on because it was a disinterested entity that didn't have you know, a stake in the neighborhood. His stake was connected to all the different groups and it, and it kind of worked that way. And, um, but then over time, it moved into the hands of an artist that I worked with, who I mentored, and, um, and he didn't have the same skill sets. And it, and it, and it took, and I was very hands off, and, uh, and the project suffered you know, from that and, uh, and came to a, a, a difficult ending. <clears throat> and um, so, so, I, so learning from that, I've, I'd, I'd keep in contact with the um, uh, with the people that are 
working on the project. Like, you know, Project Row Houses has a, uh, you know, a full, it's an own staff. There's a board. I'm not on staff or board or anything. I mean, but I have my presence and I'm, I make sure that, you know, that I'm, I'm uh, connected there. But, the, but, but it's always important to me, though, that the identity of the project moves with the people that are engaged. You know, that they, that, that I mean, Carol in the project in Dallas has, uh, I mean, a completely different um, sensibility than I do about the work. Um, I didn't really uh, talk about this in the presentation, but the white cubes that were populating along the streets, it, it was an incredible opportunity, but it also came with a lot of risk, and it took a lot of effort to, to keep that risk minimized. And I understood that, and I worked really hard. And the risk is that you know, the, the, the spaces needed to, to always be impeccably clean. You know, they had to be, you know, you had to care for them so that, that they were treated as these sacred spaces so that they could live. And that was not her focus. I mean, her focus was not those spaces. Her focus was much more in the organizing of the people that, that, that were there. And, um, and, and so those, um, uh, you know, the cubes suffered. And so actually, so I think, well, several of them have been removed because, you know, they, yeah, all kind of, you know, problems here. But, you know, so for me, when, when we were talking about removing them, you know, I tried to, to articulate the value of them to her, but she just didn't see it. It had no value for her. And so, you know, so for it to move along and, and for her to bring the other energies in, it's fine. Um, I, I think maybe I had to go outside for a minute, but um, someone else might have asked this already, and it's implicit in one of the questions before, which is that um, what, is the, what, is, what is the advantage to the projects to call them artistic projects rather than any number of other things? And where do you... Um, the, the, does it really matter how, that's one. The second question, the related question is, if we were to ask people in Houston, would they know that Project Row Houses is an artwork created by Rick Lowe, or how would they describe it? Hmm. Um, okay. <clears throat> the, the, the first question, why is it important, you know, to call it uh, an art project? I think there's a lot of different reasons. I mean, there is, there's, there's the old financial reason that's very <clears throat> basic, is that, you know, doing the kind of housing projects that I'm interested in and that kind of stuff is, I mean, if it wasn't an art project, where would I get the resources from? Because I have plenty of activist friends who are doing incredible work that make all of our art world work look like nothing and they're struggling hard to, you know, to make it happen because they can't get the resources. But you know, we can leverage the, 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 the context and the framework of you know, the art of it to actually uh, uh, generate some financial possibilities here. But beyond that, though, I think what's important is that you know, when, as a project is called art, it gives people a different kind of relationship to the thing that they're dealing with. And, and, and oftentimes it, 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 it implies something that's special, you know, and so people give it a different kind of attention. So for instance, with the, uh, with the, um, uh, the, the opening of this park in, in Houston, we, um, uh, we had a, uh, a funder that was saying, okay, well there's all this vacant land around, and you know, and it, you know, it's all overgrown and this kind of stuff. And we're going to have this opening of the new park, and it's going to be all this cluttered stuff. So we're going to give. We we like to give a uh, a grant to Project for Houses to hire a contractor to come and clean up all the lots. Now, you could do that as a 
you know, a, a, a cleanup kind of thing. But you can also take that and say, let's frame this cleanup as an art project, right? Let's, let's frame it as, and, and do things, design, you know, the t-shirts and all these kinds of things and make it an art project kind of thing that give people a different relationship to that than just the cleanup. If it's just the cleanup, people are gonna see somebody, you know, coming through cleaning up the neighborhood and they're gonna, you know, eventually go out and start, you know, just gonna throw stuff again. But frame it within the context of this, of an, of an art project and getting people engaged in it and invested in it that way I mean, we've got so much more leverage, and the project became so much more than just a cleanup. It became a point of pride and and, uh, and ownership of people in the neighborhood who participated in that in that that project. So, um, so I mean, there 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 there, you know, those those are just two reasons. But I think also, you know, it also gives it it, it gives the. Um, it gives us an advantage to be riskier. You know, I mean, people, when you, when you start talking about housing as an art project, then immediately that prepares people for something that might be non-traditional. You know, and so, anyway, there's loads of those kinds. And your second question was? How would anyone in oh, Houston would, people, would describe it? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I think, um, although we've had, you know, the demographics are shifting uh, now, but, but I would say certainly, you know, I, I was always, you know, impressed with our neighbors and neighborhood folks and how articulate they were about Project Row Houses as an art project. People in the neighborhood, I mean, they, they know it, you know. In fact, um, um, you know, and, and I think just over the, the project being there for such a long period of time, you know, there's a certain kind of vocabulary that people have picked up, you know, and talk about things. I mean, you know, you have these little kids from the neighborhood talking about installations and, you know, and, and talking about, oh, that person was conceptual. And, that, you know, I mean, they, you know, it's just things they pick up from being, you know, being around and being involved. Anyway, so um, I was wondering if you could speak to a situation in which maybe you faced a red light that was insurmountable, or if there's a situation where you walked away from a project or abandoned it because you found a situation that you actually didn't want to enter. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, it's, it's hard for people to talk about projects that didn't work and that kind of stuff, but I, you know, I. I, I enjoy talking about them because that's, you know, I mean, they, they, they live with me and I learn from them. And um, um, was it 2000, 2014? I spent about a year working on a project with, um, with um, uh, a group in Philadelphia, uh, the Asian Arts Initiative. And, you know, and at a certain point, I just didn't feel that there was a, uh, that we, we shared the same values about how we connect. With, I'm not saying that they, didn't ha that they didn't value the community that they were working with, but there was just a different kind of way that, that they approached it than I did. And I eventually, you know, you know, suggested to them that they needed to get another artist. You know, and uh, and and but also being respectful of them and, and understanding that they're I mean, I like them, but we were just not in sync in terms of how how I feel about working with, you know, different communities. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, 
leave them hanging out. They had a funder that had given them funds uh, to do a project based on my involvement. And so to, to salvage that, I used it as an opportunity to um, mentor a couple of young artists that, um, that I was able to bring them in in a different context. But it wasn't my work, really. I mean, it, was, it, it turned out to be the work of these young folks that I mentored because I just, you know, I, I couldn't, because I, you know, for me, I like to go deep. You know, I like to go deep in those relationships. And when you go deep in those relationships, you have to be really real. You know, because otherwise, when things kind of mess up or get messy, people get hurt. You know, people lose jobs, people lose all, you know, all kind of stuff. And so, you know, I mean, so I had to find, so, so, the, so we ended up readjusting the project with these uh, younger artists that I was mentoring that was, to, you know, it turned out to be fine, but it was much more on a surface level that didn't, you know, have the kind of depth that I usually go for. So we worked it out amicably, but it was, it was I mean, I, it was just red flashes all the way for me. It's like, yes. The very last question, and then uh, we will stop, and Rick is going to be here for other two days, so you have time to ask as many questions as you want. <clears throat> Amazing work. Um, the only question I have um, really is in the, the actual work that was done to renovate the houses. Um, and since this project has been just growing and growing and growing and there's always this new things going on um, as project to project, were there skill sets uh, for the people who lived in that neighborhood who now, you know, because of, you also did uh, in the MIT uh, scale research, there was a proportion of what jobs were, you know, available for the people now living within this community. So were you able to give certain skill sets to people who w worked within these projects from the neighborhood or did you bring people from outside? To, to build these um, row houses. Yeah, you know I haven't been able to um, figure out how to how to how to share that in presentation form, but um, but I tell you that's you know to me ultimately that's the most important thing about the work is 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 creating because I I think there's so much power and so much capacity and ability that exists within neighborhoods, but. We don't design things in a way that it can manifest itself. And, um, and so, you know, so I'm always looking for that. And I can tell you this whole thing through the, uh, the EEDC at, at Project Row Houses, I mean, that, I'm, I'm always amazed at the, the, the way that people are coming up. You know, I mean, they're like people that you've seen around and just kind of, knew that they did certain things and all of a sudden they're showing their capacity in ways of, and then and there are people in the neighborhood who who've been doing great things outside of the neighborhood that we didn't even know about so i mean if, uh, one of the best examples the guy who's the project manager of this whole thing right now we were having all these meetings with um, um after the mit folks kind of gave us some research stuff the platform to go on and there was this guy who just sounded like super smart about planning stuff. And, um, and then one day I started talking to him and I remember, I, I, I don't know how I didn't remember him before, but back in like the late 90s, when Boston was undergoing the big dig, there was this guy, Curtis Davis, who managed that entire project. And he lives in the third ward now, he's in, he's in our neighborhood. And he's doing stuff all over the place but nobody knew. I mean, we didn't know that. He, and then all of a sudden, it was like, wow. So, I mean, there are all those resources that are there. And some of them are even ho more homegrown. Like um, uh, one of the women from our Young Mothers program, I didn't talk about her, but she's a woman who started out on a Young Mothers program, went on and got her PhD at uh, Penn State in sociology and taught at University of Pittsburgh for a few years. She came back and she served as the uh, vice chair of the housing authority in Houston. And, uh, and set up her own research center. And so, so much of that research 
that is happening in the neighborhood is happening through her, her work, and she's employing neighborhood researchers and training them. So all of us, you know, so it's a, yeah. Okay. Thank you Thank so you much. Guys. Thank Great. you. So tomorrow at four o'clock, right? <laughs>